There we are. Okay. Well, Hello. Um, my name is Mark Hoffman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Brain Trust. We are a platform that helps parents to connect with certified teachers and learning specialists for a wide range of academic supports. And today I am here with Dr. Beth King, who is an expert in many things, one of them being dysgraphia. Um, and we're going to um, focus our conversation on that. But before we dive in, I wanted to pass it over to Beth to share a little bit more about her background. Hi, thanks, Mara, for having me. Um, I hope the there's an airplane flying overhead. Hopefully it's not too disruptive. Can't hear it at all. Perfect. So I'm a clinical child psychologist and a neuropsychologist, and I actually developed an interest in dysgraphia probably 30 years ago now when I was just starting to practice, and my nephew actually, my sister's son, was diagnosed with dysgraphia, mm -hmm. and I was like, what's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> I do... In, I run a group practice in New York City, Treat NYC, although I'm now in Arizona. <laughs> having, the world is virtual, so that's okay. Yeah, exactly. And I'm the uh, moderator for a Facebook dysgraphia group called Thriving with Dysgraphia. Um, and if anybody wants to join it, I'm happy to have you. Just be sure to agree to the rules and answer the questions. Anyway, you know the drill. Anyway, so I started addressing, educating myself about dysgraphia 30 years ago when no one had heard of it in order to provide better advice to my sister about her son. Um, dysgraphia, like so many pediatric LDs has a genetic element to it. And so my younger daughter turned out to have dysgraphia. So I bring to the table what I think is a fairly unique combination in that I know the science of it, I know how to diagnose it and accommodate it, and I know from a parent's point of view. Um, what it's like. My daughter is now an adult and living independently. And I always like to tell people that because people, parents get really scared that their kids aren't going to be able to manage in life, especially if they have severe dysgraphia and have trouble with almost any form of handwriting. So it, it's it's a very survivable LD, so to speak. And I want people to know that. Yeah, and I think especially now, thanks to all of the technology and resources that are available, it makes a profound difference in the life of anybody who has any sort of learning disability, really. Um, or you know disabilities that, aren't, that don't have to do with learning as well. Um, and we'll definitely, I think, from what I've seen in you know all of the um, comments you've made in um, some of the listservs that I'm on, you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to those resources that I think um, so many people would love to learn more about. I know I would as well. Um, but before we get into that, I would love to hear, given you know your knowledge of both sides of um, this learning difference, can you tell us just a little bit more about kind of what is dysgraphia and um, both kind of like how it impacts the brain really, I think would be really um, helpful to understand because it seems like that's such a big part of also how you work on remediation and providing support is understanding how it impacts learning. Absolutely. So dysgraphia is a low incidence learning difference, which is why a lot of people don't know about it. And it's really misunderstood. And as best we understand, and we don't understand neurologically the physiology of most learning disabilities, we know elements of it. And that's true about dysgraphia too. But dysgraphia kind of resides somewhere between the frontal and the prefrontal cortex, um, which means, and it off, it tends, they're very, it's a spectrum. 
So some people have it worse than others. Mm -hmm. You don't get over dysgraphia. If you have it, you have it. Mm -hmm. have it as an adult in the Thriving with Dysgraphia Facebook group. We have college students with dysgraphia and we have adults with dysgraphia um, who are now raising their own dysgraphic kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that's useful. You know, they have a lot of insight to bring to the group. But it basically involves the ability to coordinate visual spatial skills and language skills and motor, particularly fine motor skills. And so there's a lot of room for things to go wrong. Yeah. Because that's a complex interaction. And of course, individual people with it will be more weighted toward problems with one area or with another, perhaps. It may not be evenly balanced. And then there are a lot of myths about it floating around, um, not to name names, but there are some people who argue that everybody who's dysgraphic really has stealth dyslexia. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's a form of dyslexia. And I understand the logic behind that. The feeling is, first of all, a lot, although not all dyslexics are also dysgraphic. Mm -hmm. The component of dyslexia is visual spatial processing and problems with it and left-right reversals and things like that. And it's, but it's not really true that they're the same thing. There's really no research that substantiates that. They're what are called comorbidities, meaning they often occur together in the same person, probably from a common cause or elements of a common cause. The same thing with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And so again, a lot of people, especially educators, think that what dysgraphia really is, is a kind of rushing and carelessness. Mm -hmm. And what they point out accurately is that almost all dysgraphic kids with enough concentration and kind of willpower can write legibly. The problem is that one of the ways I think think about dysgraphia is that it's really a failure to develop automaticity. Mm -hmm. Dysgraphic kids typically don't have their handwriting, their letter formation doesn't become automatic and practice doesn't help. That's important. Like when I got my daughter formally assessed, obviously I couldn't do her own testing. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find it. I knew she had dysgraphia. I'd known since preschool. Um, and every year I said to the teacher, don't you think we should be concerned about her handwriting? And they all said, oh, no, it'll be fine. And I said, yeah. So in third grade, my daughter, um, I got a notice that they were going to have her repeat the grade. And that was kind of and she went to a very good, very supportive public elementary school. And that was kind of shocking because mm -hmm. she was a model student and she's very bright. And they said, oh, well, but look at her written expression. And, you know, they'd be asked to write, this was third grade, maybe a page about a New York City landmark. I raised my kids in New York City. And um, she would write, the Empire State Building is tall. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of it. So of course they thought that she was dumb and not getting it and needed to repeat third grade. And I was like, no, ask her that question and scribe for her. And reams of material poured out of her, all well-organized, thoughtful, yeah. and accurate, or at least reasonably accurate, as, a, as accurate as you expect a third grader to be. And they were like, oh, and I <laughs> said, yeah, she has dysgraphia. 
Yeah. She, does, she does not need to repeat the grade. She needs to be accommodated. And she, as I said, she went to a good supportive school and they said, oh, we don't know what that is. And I said, well, let me teach you. Mm -hmm. And by the way, back then she used an alpha smart, which is like a small keyboard yeah. um, that's very child proof. Um, and I said, and I'll be sending in an alpha smart for her to use. And my sister mailed me her son Alpha Smart because he's like three, four years older than she. So he was by then in middle school and using a laptop. And ta-da, problem solved and my daughter no longer needed to repeat the grade. Yeah. But the neuropsychologist who evaluated her, who knew diddly about it, um, said that she should practice writing out the alphabet every night multiple times mm -hmm. and that, that would cure the problem. As I said before, practice doesn't help mm -hmm. because dysgraphics don't do things automatically. They don't, they typically also have a lot of trouble with things like memorizing times tables. Um, I'm, my daughter is in her mid twenties and very high functioning, and I'm not completely sure she can recite the months of the year in order. Yeah. Couldn't last time I asked her, which was, she was maybe 19, you know, and she went to a high school for gifted kids. I mean, <laughs> yes, but she just, that kind of information, that's why I say that this graphia, pretty much inevitably involves a failure to establish automaticity. And handwriting, the guide shouldn't be whether your kid can write neatly or not with enough concentration. Kids usually describe themselves as drawing the letters. Mm -hmm. They think what a capital A looks like, and they very carefully draw it as if they're sketching the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. You know, but that's not useful for doing work. And what happens is that they spend all their time thinking about how do you do it instead of thinking about the content of what they're trying to say. Yeah. And, and so you want to give them alternative ways of getting their work written down that don't require so much thought because you want them to focus on the content, not on how was that you draw an A again. And I think, you know, thinking of identification of this challenge early on, also at the time when kids are learning um, foundational reading patterns, plus handwriting, plus how to form sentences and how to expand those sentences into more detailed ideas, it's this whole circle of skills that are so intertwined mm -hmm. and that handwriting piece truly does get in the way of all of the other ones that kids are trying to develop. Mm -hmm. And um, I can only imagine the complexities of trying to separate those two things out for the average teacher that's just looking at a child that can't get their ideas down on the page. And, you know, does it have to do with spelling? Does it have to do with the mechanics of writing itself, the fine motor skills? Or does it have to do with the fact that the child isn't making the connections and doesn't understand the concepts and isn't picking up on the rules? Um, I'm sure it's really difficult to identify where the specific issue lies um, very early on, which I imagine causes this to go undiagnosed for so many kids. Often, kids often, my daughter was diagnosed in third grade. And remember, I was a savvy consumer who already knew she had dysgraphia. Mm -hmm. In preschool, she said to me, Mommy, I know that an L goes like this, but I can't make my hand do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. Honey, that your brain has to develop to a certain point, like angulation is is actually a neurological milestone. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're just like you lost your teeth early, late, rather, and just like you learned to walk late, your brain is very smart, but it's slow at this stuff. It'll come, but it's just not there yet. Yeah. And so, 
for parents who perhaps are concerned about their kids or concerned that something might be different about the way that their child is learning, are there specific sort of um, like not necessarily warning signs, but specific markers of skills that a child should overcome that, um, you know, that are these milestones developmentally that um, can sort of raise a red flag for parents for um, perhaps dysgraphia being a part of their child's learning profile? Yeah. In the little ones, the preschoolers, the kindergartners, um, look for whether there's a, all the little ones can express themselves better verbally than with handwriting. But look at what that discrepancy is like in your kids and see if it's bigger than in other kids. You know, see if your kid has a level of sophistication verbally that they can't begin to capture with handwriting. Also look for things like, in this is more school-aged than preschool-aged, but dysgraphic kids, not 100% of them, but the vast majority of them, there's a distinctive look to their handwriting. They throw in capital letters at random in the middle of words. Their spacing is uneven. There'll be a gap as if it were a space between words in the middle of a word and then the next two words will collide. Mm -hmm. um, they veer up and down off the line or all the letters sit on the line, even the ones that should rise above or below, like say a G or a lowercase p. Mm -hmm. um, if your kid is doing those kind of things, it's almost certain that they have dysgraphia. Obviously you need to find a dysgraphia savvy neuropsychologist to evaluate them. Another clue you brought up about learning writing mechanics, spelling, things like that. The thing about, again, you have to look at what's age appropriate, but the thing about dysgraphic kids is they can tell you all the rules. Mm -hmm. If I would say to my daughter, when do you use a capital letter? She could tell me proper nouns, the beginning of a sentence, but that never stopped her from throwing a capital somewhere in the middle of the word just because, I don't know why, just because <laughs> that's what bubbled up. The right. same thing for punctuation. She knew the rules. She couldn't apply the rules. And that's part of why teachers and sometimes parents say, oh, he's just careless. He mm -hmm. knows the rules. Mm -hmm. That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. Um so if you know your kid can explain the rules to you verbally, then you've got it. You know they know the rules. There's no point in teaching them the rules. Right. Because they know them. It's a different kind of a problem. And I really say to parents, it depends on the school and kind of how accelerated it is, but at the po there's a point around third or fourth grade, depending on the school system, where the learning rate just accelerates. All of a sudden, kids are expected to do a lot more work, mm -hmm. and their reading and their writing is to acquire and demonstrate knowledge. They're no longer practicing the skills themselves. And if your child is dysgraphic and isn't yet able, and they're probably not, so don't feel badly about this, mm -hmm. to write effortlessly, fluently, and automatically, mm -hmm. that's the point where you really have to start teaching them to type yeah. and use bypass strategies. There'll be slow typists at first. Um, my daughter had an accommodation. Her school start well, the state starts giving standardized testing in third grade, and she had an accommodation that her testing was scribed. Um, both anything she had to write and the bubbling mm -hmm. on the computer scored sheets because she didn't have the control 
to yep. do that either. And honestly, she still, all the way through school, she had that accommodation, except that as her typing speed improved, she typed answers instead of having them scribed. But she has never completed a bubble sheet in her life. <laughs> well, it's also one of those things, those bubble sheets in particular, where you need to use them for this very small moment in time. And then, you know, you graduate high school and you really don't ever need to use a bubble sheet again in college. I can't remember ever using one. And it's only on these standardized tests. Um, so even also just thinking about the fact that we have to spend time teaching students that skill in isolation for test taking is ridiculous. Okay. Um, you know, so, but I think something that you brought up that third, fourth grade juncture um, in a lot of these conversations with different experts, I know that that juncture has come up quite often in helping to um, sort of be a, a milestone for identifying executive function issues mm -hmm. or identifying ADHD as, you know, being mm -hmm. a um, underlying learning issue for kids. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's both a big academic jump in terms of the expectations of classroom performance and the type of learning students do, but it also is such a big developmental moment in time for kids. Um, so I think, you know, having that be a um, specific anchor point for parents to be able to identify whether a child is just moving slowly and progressing at their own pace versus there being an underlying difference that is causing these sorts of delays is a really helpful um, guidepost because so many parents are just, you know, it's so hard to determine and especially if it's your first child or you don't spend that much time in a classroom or around other kids looking at these kinds of, um, questions about learning. It's so hard to know whether what you're seeing with your child is normal or whether it's different than what other kids are doing. Right. Um, so I think that's that's really helpful to have in mind. Yeah, um, dysgraphia, the other real red flag for dysgraphia is kids say their hand hurts when they write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, you can take your kid to an OT and they'll teach them to relax their shoulders and their hand muscles. And you can try a hundred thousand different pencil grips and all of those things will help. Don't misunderstand yeah. me. But if your kid says their hand hurts when they write once they're elementary school age, they've got dysgraphia almost certainly. Interesting. Interesting. Well, and I think that that's a nice segue into typing skills because I know that that, um, you know, typing and speech to text tools are crucially important um, to the success of um, both students and adults with dysgraphia. Um, and one of the things that um, I know has come up in the discussion is um, you saying that those students with dysgraphia should not learn um, touch typing in the regular way and keyboarding skills as they're typically taught. Um, so, you know, I think it would be really interesting to hear, you know, if handwriting is difficult, of course, it makes sense to transition to typing. Um, but why is it that the standard hand placement and keyboarding skills that are so frequently taught to students, why are those not a good fit for um, kids who have dysgraphia? I can answer that. I want to start by saying, however, because people don't realize this, there are no advantages to anybody in using touch typing. Mm -hmm stage in technological development. Touch typing was developed to slow typists down. Mm -hmm. Because typists way back with manual typewriters could overtype the mechanical speed of the um, of the device and the keys jammed. I yeah. learned it on a mechanical typewriter on that age and the keys hit and locked together because I was fast and so they developed touch typing to slow people down hmm. I think touch typing is faster it's not and they developed it so that you would never look at the keyboard because you were a stenographer transcribing shorthand mm -hmm. nobody does that anymore I don't think they even teach people shorthand yeah so it's essentially an archaic skill, but everybody thinks it's the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So 
starting with the fact that there are no real reasons to teach anybody touch typing anymore. <laughs> um, basically, if you look at the way people who teach themselves to type type, they pretty much all do it the same way. Um, and they're fast, mm -hmm. most of them. You know, they use their first fingers and they go like this and they look at the keyboard, but they basically know more or less where the keys are and they zoom through. And that's essentially the technique that I and some other people call adaptive mm -hmm. typing and that dysgraphic kids should use. The reason they should use that is, well, there's several reasons. One is most dysgraphic kids have poor motor planning mm -hmm. and motor memory issues. They have trouble. That's that whole automaticity. So having the practice 900 times that your first finger goes up to the R and you're supposed to know where the R is without looking, they're not going to learn it. But if they look at the keyboard, they see the R and they go, boop, yeah. and they got it. Um, and you want to minimize the reason typing works better for dysgraphic kids than handwriting is because it requires less motor planning. It requires less working memory. It requires fewer visual spatial skills. And so you want them to type in a way that minimizes those demands mm -hmm. because it comes out the same anyhow. Yeah. And again, you want them not to be thinking about now, how am I supposed to hit that R key again? You want them to be thinking about what they want to say and to be thinking in complete sentences and just get it down. Right. And so you should be teaching adapted typing techniques. Kids as young as kindergarten can learn them pretty easily. Obviously, they won't be as fast as when they're in middle school, but they don't have to write as much. Right. Either. You know, so like I said before, my daughter had a scribe for time tests, which were essentially the standardized tests, but everything else she keyboarded. Mm -hmm. And her typing speed increased with experience and with physical maturation, as did the demands of the school in terms of, you know, how much kids were expected to write. And so it pretty much evolved seamlessly. And by middle school, and again, she went to an accelerated test in middle school program. Um, so the the academics were one to two years ahead of um, grade level, whatever that means. Um, she just sat there with her laptop and typed, and she probably typed about 60 words a minute then, Yeah, which is plenty sufficient. Definitely. Even for an adult. Um, and there are, you're not going to want, your kid to focus on spelling or punctuation or any of that. The computer handles a lot of that automatically now. Mm -hmm. and there's a really good software package called CoWriter, C O colon W R I T E R, which is a predictive typing program. It's Don Johnston is the company, the man in the company that mark that developed it and marketed it but it helps kids improve their spelling um and it learns kids typical misspellings for those kids that are really abominable spellers <laughs> and so it their spelling will improve using it and their it will speed up their typing and it avoids having to turn spelling into a class yeah, it's just going to get better with experience. And again, if it's not perfect, as long as it's good enough that spell check catches right. most of the errors, which it will be after a while, mm -hmm. it kind of doesn't matter. Because just like you were saying that bubbling is like this odd splinter skill that becomes outmoded. Adults don't handwrite. Yeah, ever. Hardly ever. You know, somebody says, write this down. And I'm like, oh, do I have a pen? I wonder where it is. <laughs> and so it's really a 
problem that solves itself. Mm -hmm. By high school, most kids are expected to be typing their work anyway. And so it's kind of an elementary school problem. And there's all kinds of software that helps kids. Uh, You know, for elementary school, it has to be used on an iPad. But um, MathPad Mm -hmm. types the numbers and keeps them in alignment so that you know, and then once you're up to algebra and beyond, there's free software that's available free to special needs kids anywhere in the world from an Australian company called FFX, E-F-O-F-E-X. Um, and their software is developed for math and science teachers to produce worksheets and stuff, but it... Um, works and it'll do all the graphs and label them so you can write your lab report and it can do calculus and exponents and logarithms it's a much more complicated program you wouldn't want to use it with younger kids Mm -hmm. but it's a lifesaver and then they can and it embeds itself just fine within word or whatever and so you just type your math yeah, and I think highlighting I feel like when people say dysgraphia, you think of all the implications for writing and sort of written expression in terms of English and note taking and words. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, it it would be such a hindrance to students who understand these mathematical con- mathematical concepts. But when you have to organize your work on the page all of the calculation errors that result from misaligned columns Mm -hmm. um, would have such a huge impact on a child's confidence in math class because it can lead to that feeling of like, I just don't get it because I can't get the right answer, but they can't get the right answer simply because of this issue of, um, you know, spacing and alignment. Um, So brought up another really important point, which is that right now the, the term dysgraphia is used to refer to two separate syndromes, and they're really quite distinct. Dysgraphia in the form that I use it has to do with the mechanics of written expression. Can you handwrite? Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't, and that's the proper use of the term. There's an, in recent years, just the last couple of years, people have also started calling disorder of written expression dysgraphia. That's where you may actually have fine handwriting and have no trouble writing it down, but you have trouble. It's language disorder, and it comes neurologically from a different place in the brain, and you can have a written expressive language problem, even if you don't have a spoken one, Mm -hmm. although more frequently you have both. And you, a lot of people say, my kid doesn't know how to figure out what to say. So the first thing you have to do is accommodate the handwriting because you can't tell whether your kid can figure out what they want to say if they're spending all their time trying to figure out how to write the letter A. Right. Right. Then, if they still are showing problems with organization, that executive functioning, planning a piece of writing, um, figuring out how to word things well, that kind of stuff at an age-appropriate level, Mm -hmm. that is either an executive functioning problem and or an expressive language disorder, and it's best treated by a speech and language therapist. Mm-hmm. And oh, so intertwined, and so, so many. intertwined, and psychologists all the time. First of all, they do it because DSM five combines them into dis, um, specific learning disability and writing. But secondly, they do it because people don't separate it properly in their thinking. And you've got to know whether your kid has one, the other, or both, because they have different solutions. Yeah. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. 
Um, well, and I think, you know, I'm mindful of time, but I have one other question, which I think comes up a lot with so many of the families that I work with. And, um, you know, that's the speech to text software, because I know um, a lot of kids who I have worked with in the past love the speech to text because it helps to overcome some of their keyboarding challenges, especially as it relates to keeping up their ability to get their ideas on the as quickly as the ideas come to their brain, because that leads to so much frustration around writing. Mm -hmm. and, um, some of the issues that come along with speech to text are a lot of the inaccuracies with um, word identification, and also a complete lack of attention to punctuation, um, which creates a whole host of editing issues for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. um, plus it, an over-reliance on speech to text then makes it very difficult to take notes in class, for example, because you're not developing fluency with keyboarding skills. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, the ability to use the keyboard, not necessarily how you're using it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are your feelings about speech to text software versus a focus on teaching kids to use a keyboard early on? I really prefer the kids use a keyboard early on for all the reasons you described. You can't really use speech to text in the classroom. It bothers the other kids. Right. And the goal for a dysgraphic student should always be to allow them to complete their work in class along with the other kids, you know, as fluently as possible. And I think that speech to text doesn't understand young children's voice as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're very frustrated. It doesn't help them with the spelling and all of that. And at some point, they really do have to learn right. with, you know, technology helping them. But they, you've got to be able to succeed in school. You have to be able to produce a piece of work that's organized with proper writing mechanics and things. And I feel like kids get so frustrated with speech to text. And it becomes sort of like a bad crutch. Yeah. And I'd rather just not introduce it. People feel like their kids can't keyboard when they're little. But with adapted keyboarding techniques, they really can. Mm -hmm. And they don't do all that much writing when they're little anyway, let's be honest. I would rather see a kid scribe, have a parent or a teacher or a pair of scribe for them if they have a long piece of work they need to get out and their typing skills aren't up to it yet because then that sort of places it as the exception mm -hmm. you know and that's what you want to think of it schools think oh just give them speech to text and i'll never have to pay attention to the problem that they're dysgraphic again Right. Also, it doesn't address any of the problems like doing your math, do it, writing a lab report. Yeah. You, you know, and some people like dictating. I mean, some adults dictate, most don't, and there's a reason for that. And to do it properly, you have to learn to utter your periods and everything, you know. I saw this person on October 3rd, period, yeah. who was blah, 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 blah. That's, there's no way you're going to get a first or second grader able to do that. Yeah. And so it's funny. I'm strongly on the typing side of it. I, um, I feel like that has always been my intuition, especially with students who I see using speech to text software a lot, leading to all sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just add that my father, Funnily is one of those people that I grew up listening to him dictate all of his um, reports that he would write. He's a child psychiatrist and he does a lot of custody evaluations. Mm -hmm. And I have endless memories in my childhood of coming in on my father, holding the dictaphone to his mouth, saying, blah, 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 period, blah, 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 comma. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like it, one, made me especially attuned to the importance of that punctuation and how you include it in your writing also 
you know, as an adult watching students who struggle so much with wanting to use dictation because handwriting is so challenging for them and they're not fluent with the keyboard, but it leads to this whole host of other challenges that it creates with the act of writing um, and accuracies and misstatements and endless punctuation issues. Um, so it's always seemed that just diving right into keyboarding was um, a good step for so many kids, whether or not that dysgraphia is the issue that is making writing so difficult for them. Um, but those skills, you know, the earlier on that you can develop them, certainly the um, easier it is to overcome all of the complexities. Absolutely, because also these kids have to learn to take notes. Yeah. And a lot of parents push for an accommodation in their IEP of being given class notes in advance. But good teachers generally haven't planned out everything they're going to say. You know, you want the class to be able to flow with what the kids bring up. And so there may not be discussion that follows some notes. Yeah, the teacher has planned the class, presumably, but, and later, I mean, I remember when my older daughter, not the dysgraphic one, was in high school, she, um, some of her teachers asked a kid in each class to take notes so that if a kid was absent, they could get the notes. They had like a notebook of notes. But, you know, taking notes is so idiosyncratic. What you focus on, what's important. How do you develop the skill of both writing and listening at the same time? Mm -hmm. And it and taking notes, actually, I believe is a skill that does continue to need to be used mm -hmm. into adulthood. Yeah. You know, you go to and your doctor or whatever, and you might want to jot down some notes about what they said. And so I really want to get kids, dysgraphic or not, on a good road to knowing how to take notes. Yeah. And I think also just from a learning perspective, that skill is so important with active listening and like synthesizing ideas and organizing information in a meaningful way, which does vary, very a lot between different students, different brains, all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So also um, being able to proactively learn that skill for the sake of learning more generally um, is really important for academic success and yeah. life success, as you pointed out. Yeah, I agree. And so I really see the goal as being to give kids the skills to meet the demands Oops, so sorry. Okay. To meet the demands of the classroom, mm -hmm. to take notes, to be in there, participating, not out in the hall, dictating, yeah. to all of those things without the teacher sort of giving the kid services that the other kids don't get. The mm -hmm. services should be, here's your laptop, we're going to teach you how to use it, here's, you know, co-writer, that kind of thing. The yeah. services shouldn't be, oh, we'll tell you the notes and we'll give you the PowerPoints and you only have to answer half the questions. I think that does our kids a real disservice. I'm not saying it's never an appropriate accommodation. I'm saying for a dysgraphic child without other major problems. They should be, with the right technology and supports, they should be able to do the work just like every other kid does it. Yeah, I think, you know, all of these things are so important and your insight um, on this, the challenges that come along with this learning difference are so valuable. So thank you for taking the time to share with us. Um, I really appreciate it. It's certainly been insightful for me and gives me more food for thought and working with my students as I'm sure it will for the rest of our audience. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm happy to do it.
Yes. Um, so once again, we will have this video available on our Facebook page. I will also synthesize all of the uh, most important details into a set of bullet points that we'll include in a blog post on the Brain Trust website, which is braintrusttutors.com. And um, thank you once again, Beth King, for joining us. And thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.